The key, of course, is uh, awareness. Without awareness, there's only the movement of thought. And without awareness, there's complete identification with the movement of thought. Which means you derive your sense of who you are from thought, from mental positions, from opinions, viewpoints. In other words, opinion becomes your identity. <laughs> and that is unconscious. But this happens to many people. The opinion becomes your mental position. Your opinion and your identity become one. Then, of course, anybody who questions or contradicts your opinion or mental position is not only somebody who has a different opinion, that person is somebody who is attacking your very sense of self, your very identity. And then, of course, you react by either defending or counterattacking the other person who probably is also completely identified with their mental position. And then you have two enemies. <laughs> and uh, the same thing happens collectively in groups of people, political groups, nations, and so on. Now, the fact that the questioner could talk about them because it would be pointless. Who cares what my political opinions are? They're just opinions. And if I did pointlessly talk about my political opinions, I would lose a certain percentage of my uh, participants, viewers, whatever you want to call them, because they would become very annoyed. If I had a different opinion, another percentage would become very annoyed. Now, it's not that I want, don't want to lose a percentage of participants. There's something much more important than trying to perhaps convince other people that my opinion is valid or more true than their opinion. There's something much more important than that. And that is the focus of my life is to help people become aware, not to adopt a particular way of thinking or particular viewpoint or opinion. It's all secondary. It's to become aware so that they are no longer possessed by the, the movement of thought and identify completely with the movement of thought. And even if, let's say, if I had a discussion with somebody very different, well, maybe politics or something connected with politics. Let's say if I were, this person expressed an opinion or viewpoint that was totally different from mine, and not only different from mine, let's say that I am convinced that this person is out of touch with reality and completely deluded. Uh, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that this, which, which may be true. It may be true that there are certain opinions that are so irrational and completely deluded that everyone would say, yes, would I tell this person, you are completely deluded, this is totally wrong? No, I would not. It would be pointless. I would be like a psychiatrist, let's say, a person comes to a patient, comes to a psychiatrist. Let's say the patient believe, believes to be Napoleon, 100% sure that he's Napoleon. If I'm a good psychiatrist, I will not tell this person, obviously, you're not Napoleon. I can tell you exactly why you're not Napoleon. You, you must get rid of this absurd belief that you're Napoleon. I would completely lose connection with this person because this person is identified with that that viewpoint and to this person there would no longer be any communication the person would immediately shut down 
a good psychiatrist would only listen. He would listen and then gradually would attempt to bring some awareness in the patient instead of denying whatever opinion or viewpoint, no, no matter how deluded this patient has, it is much more important for some awareness to arise in the patient. So if I were a psychiatrist, any good psychiatrist knows that he would not immediately deny, he would listen. A good psych or psychologist, most psychiatrists, I suppose, these days prescribe just medication, but uh, as a psychotherapist, I would I'd listen. And in the listening, there is, a, there is an awareness. There's the awareness. And if you are a good listener, then the awareness can, to some extent, be transmitted to the patient or whatever the other person. They can some some awareness can arise if one person is able to hold that space of awareness. There was a famous psychologist, psychotherapist in America. I don't know when he lived in the 50s, I think, or 50s or 60s. Carl Rogers, he practiced that type of therapy, which is unconditional acceptance and pure listening to the, the patient. Never, never condemning, never labeling, just pure. This is Rogerian therapy. There's still people who practice it, and it's a very, very spiritual form of psychotherapy, although he doesn't use spiritual terms. Just in the, the listening is important. So, even let's bring this back now to a, an ordinary situation conversation between two people who hold completely different political views. Again, instead of contradicting, are you just able to be, just listen? Just listen. The listening itself implies that there's an awareness there. Without awareness, you cannot really listen because while the other person is speaking, you're immediately contradicting and formulating your own counter arguments in your mind. You're not listening. You're just, you're just already countering whatever the other person is saying or getting annoyed about it and getting upset because obviously what the other person is saying is so nonsensical, you can't stand it anymore. <laughs> Awareness. So this is the reason why I don't, I don't talk about my political views. They are not important. My work is to bring awareness. That's, and there's a lot of irrational thinking around these days in the field of politics and so on. I'm not interested in pointing out the very areas that I regard as irrational. My work is to bring awareness, to help humans access that dimension of awareness. That's what matters, not what opinions they hold. And when there's awareness, then you're no longer in the grip of your opinion. Opinion is not no longer your identity because your identity is the awareness. And then you hold an opinion more loosely. It's still there, but you're holding it more loosely. And you can, you can tell somebody about it if they don't like it, if they completely contradict. It's no longer an attack on you at all because your identity is not, not derived from thought. Your identity, your sense of identity is not arrived from your opinion, from your mental position. And that's the liberation from being in the grip of thought. But you still think, of course. So it's a good thing that with awareness, you're able to, to listen to completely different viewpoints and hold that space of awareness and listening while you're interacting with another and realize that underneath the human, the human is talking, the human is expressing his or her opinion, but there's also the being underneath. The being doesn't have a political opinion or any opinion. The being is the consciousness. So that you can sense the consciousness in the other 
the human because you can sense the consciousness, the being, and yourself. So we, there's always two people there. You interact with two beings. There's a person, and there's the being behind the person. The same as you. You're a person, but you're also the consciousness that gives rise to the person. If you can sense that consciousness while you're listening and speaking, then the other is cannot be your enemy anymore because you can sense that which transcends any opinion, the essential beingness of the other. Some people say the humanity of the other. Yes, we are both humans beyond their political opinion. You can sense the humanity of the other that you share. That's conventional usage. But conventional usage here doesn't work because I've already defined as human and being. So instead of saying you sense the humanity of the other, I say you sense the beingness of the other. This is perhaps what some people mean when they say humanity of the other. You can sense the beingness of the other. And there, that is where this is essential thing that we call loving kindness comes in the loving kindness the emanation of loving kindness towards another human being no matter what their mental position happens to, to be at this present time whatever they think as a, a person and uh, obviously if they're so deluded that they are about to attack you then you may have to remove yourself physically. That's another story, but that's not a problem. But hopefully you're not inter going to interact or attract interactions with people who are, who are at such a low level of consciousness that going, they're going to attack you physically. Because it's amazing how many people who are so identified with their opinions that they they kill each other over opinions or viewpoints, mental positions. Uh, that's, uh, that implies complete lack of awareness, unfortunately. That's the, that would be the redeeming factor. It's happening a lot in the, in the States. There's a lot of divisiveness happening at the moment. Like humans can no longer communicate. This, is, this separation is like almost two different worlds, two different realities there. This is quite dangerous. Uh, and only awareness can diffuse the situation that otherwise would lead to violent conflict. This is why this is so important, what we're engaged in here the arising of awareness. Only awareness can be the unifying factor. Otherwise, the, uh, the division will become more and more pronounced, just as it happened in the... There was a Spanish civil war in the 30s preceding the Second World War, and, and almost a million people died within one country. It had become so divided, even in families, some people would kill each other, kill family members. Such was the division that had arisen there. Uh, so these are challenging times collectively, as you may have noticed. And this is only one aspect. So it's it's so important now for humans to to become more conscious, to awaken, to have awareness. Otherwise, we are lost. But even that's fine if humans should, if we need to regress to a, to a more unconscious state for a while, even that from a higher perspective would be okay. It's only bad from, a, from one perspective. It's very bad. To, to, are we going to move into another dark age? They talk about the dark ages after the collapse of the Roman Empire when for like 600 years or whatever, that's the Western Empire. In Europe, almost nobody could read and write anymore. The, even the, the art of building was lost in stone. They could only have wooden structures. Um, there was very little writing happening because almost nobody, except a few monks in monasteries, could still write. 
all the the great things of antiquity, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, the philosophy, the the art and the architecture and the all kinds of things, even the spirituality of deep spirituality in ancient Greece and Rome, it's called the mysteries, when people underwent spiritual change and awakening through undergoing certain rites and ordeals that were called the mysteries. But let's not go there at this time. Just the important thing is awareness, 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 so that thought does not control and possess you. That's the key. You are here, you are interacting, all of you, you're interacting with other humans. And awareness tends to spread, just like the unawareness, the unaware unconscious state also spreads, like an infection. There are thoughts that can can spread like a virus and take possession of people's minds even faster at present times because we have all these means of instant communication. So a thought can take possession of people's minds. It could be a very destructive thought. It could could be a very irrational and destructive thought or a cluster of thoughts can take possession of people's minds and then they all voice the same thing. And they think that's that's my opinion. They don't realize there's a collective thought cluster of collective thoughts that has taken possession of their minds <laughs> and they identify with it and they think that's me and the others who do, have a, a different cluster of thoughts in their mind <laughs> uh, the, uh, if a thought can be m- more harmful than a physical virus a thought can, can act as a virus in your mind and can color and shape all your perceptions and distort all your perceptions, presenting a world that's completely colored by and distorted and corrupted by by these thoughts that are taking possession of your mind. You all have seen it. One can always see it easily in individuals, an individual who is suddenly has a delusion, delusion, deluded idea has taken possession of their mind. They suddenly know Okay, whatever whatever idea comes into it gets lodged in their mind. Uh, like uh, it could be the most absurd thing, but this is easily recognized as insane. But it's, when it becomes collective, it's not recognized as insane. If I say everybody on this planet is a an alien that has come here. And I'm the only one who is still left of humanity, or there are only 10 of us left of humanity. All the others are, are evil aliens. I can see, You can just look at them. You know they're evil aliens. This a thought like that can take possession of your mind, and you can't, without awareness, you are, it's a virus. You're completely effect, infected by this mental virus. Some people have conspiracy theories, that are quite absurd, and that can they can act as a, like a mental virus too. I'm not saying that every conspiracy theory is absurd. Some actually be, turn out to be true, but that's another matter. But many are absurd. Some are true, and only discovered later that actually they're true. So I've spoken many things, but it's all, it all comes down to one thing, as Jesus said, only one thing is needed. All the rest is details. And this is Einstein's quote. Einstein said, I want to know the mind of God. All else is details. Everything else is details. What He never explained what the mind of God, what he meant by that. But I know what he meant. What is the mind of God? Consciousness. I want to know the mind of God, the consciousness that underlies the phenomenal universe. The rest is details. And again, Jesus said, the one, only one thing is needed. And you have chosen that one thing.
that's just uh, becoming aware of the present moment. No need to call it a meditation, just more simple than that. Just becoming aware of the present moment. Not only becoming aware of the content of the present moment, what I call the content of the present moment is whatever appears in your awareness. That's, for example, this person talking. It, you see the image on the screen, you hear the voice. That's part of the content of the present moment. But of course, there's a lot more, although your main focus may be on that. But there's a lot more. There's not only the image on the screen and the voice of the person. There's the screen itself, and you're probably in a room somewhere. You perceive you're peripherally aware of all that. You may have perhaps certain emotions or feelings right now. It's possible, perhaps something that's lingering, something that happened earlier today, or who knows, or something that might happen and this has a little bit of residue or something, whatever it may be, whatever emotion, anxiety or sadness. But again, if you sense anything like that, that's fine too. That's also what appears or any thoughts that come in. Also, they appear in your awareness, of course. So the the present moment is uh, what appears to your sense perception and your inner perception of thoughts and feelings. But that's not all. Well, that's already a good step in the right direction to become aware of whatever appears in this moment. Become more aware of your sense perceptions. And become aware of your thoughts. Oh, or a fully feeling or physical feeling in the body. That's good. But becoming aware of the present moment is deeper than that. You're not only aware of what appears in your field or space of awareness. This is more subtle now. you can also become aware of that space of awareness itself. That is the awareness that makes everything else possible. It's much more subtle. To become aware of that, there needs to be at least a moment of stillness. Stillness is inseparable from that. Stillness, not necessarily outer stillness. Inner stillness means a cessation of the stream of thinking. Just a little gap. What remains at first seems like nothing or nothing much or nothing 
certainly nothing interesting. Thoughts are interesting. <laughs> Can be very boring too, but even boring thoughts pretend to be interesting. But that space of stillness is not interesting, obviously. So it's something that's overlooked completely for most people. They're looking for the next thing to arise, the next, whatever it is, something that's hoped for, something that's feared, whatever it may be, the next, what's next? But if you go more deeply into the present moment, you become aware of the essence of the present moment, which is inseparable from the essence of who or what you are beyond the person, the transcendent dimension. It's very simple. Just a brief moment of stillness, but not a tired kind of stillness, an alert stillness. So the real meaning of becoming aware of the present moment really is synonymous with Becoming aware of yourself beyond the conditioned entity that is called the person. The deeper dimension to who you are. I would say that that is the most important discovery that you can make in your entire life. That is what some spiritual traditions call liberation. Liberation from what? Liberation from the conditioned person, the the entity, the limited conditioned entity. Other traditions call it awakening. Or salvation. 